Good morning. And a very warm welcome to the worship of God here this morning. Good to see you all here. Welcome to any visitors who may be with us today. Well, we've got our mum with us, so welcome to mum and anybody else who may be there. Uh, and tea and coffee through in the large hall after the service. Do come and stay, enjoy our time of fellowship together. This evening we have our cafe-style service here in the hall, six o'clock. All are welcome to that, and we will continue our a journey through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, looking this evening at the gift of prophecy. The special weekly prayer gathering in Trinity Church session room continues uh, this week, 5.30 to 6, just a short focused time, Tuesday evening, 9th of April. That's in person. Um, but good times we've had so far, and we need to continue with that. So momentum grows towards the mission in May. More of that during the service, uh, and our own prayer meeting on Zoom, 7 o'clock on Thursday, the 11th of April. The Kirk Session meet in the lounge on Tuesday, 9th of April, after the stated annual meeting at 7 o'clock. Normally, we have the stated annual meeting at half past seven, after we've approved the accounts. We've already approved the accounts of the session, so the stated annual meeting is coming first. That's open to all members of the congregation, and this edict needs to be read in that connection. A meeting of the communicants and the role of Teviot and Roberton Church will be held in the lounge on Tuesday 9th of April 2024 at 7 p.m. at which the Kirk Session will submit a statement of accounts for the year ended 31st December 2023 by order of the Kirk Session Alistair Cook moderator. So you've been duly served with that edict. So all members of the congregation look forward to the lounge being packed out with the congregation at seven o'clock before we continue thereafter. In the past years, it's been Sheila, and it was Mary before that, but uh, then Mary became an elder, so she was there anyway. So I think Sheila, so anybody else who wishes to come, very welcome. Next Sunday, our services, 9.45 in St. Mary's and 11.15 here in TV as today, our new pattern for this four months. It's all the intimations. Let us worship God. We're going to have the um, call to worship. Some words from Revelation 7, verses 9 to 12. I'll say the words that are not in bold, but if you can join in with the acclamations of praise to God in bold, there's two of them, that'll be good. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne. Oh. Ah. All the angels were standing round the throne and round the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> Amen. We're going to sing to God's praise now. Uh, last Sunday, we had a couple of songs where the sound didn't work, so we sang unaccompanied, and quite a number of people have said to me how good that was to hear us all singing together, so taking us at our word, and we're going to sing Psalm 100, unaccompanied, fairly well-known psalm. I've chosen it because of the opening speaks about the whole world being called to worship God, which ties in with our theme today. So we're going to stand to sing unaccompanied. I'll be the presenter. We'll follow my lead. But do remember, you're allowed to sing harmonies as well, so don't feel because I'm singing unison you need to sing unison. If you can know the harmonies, join in with them, and we will be in the music makers ourselves with our voices, even though there's no band or organ. Let us stand to worship God.
Let us pray. Lord God, our Father, we bow before you. We come as your people here, together with all your people throughout the earth and the ages and the heaven, to glorify you as our God. We know you are our God indeed, and we worship you and we long for you to have all the glory for the whole earth to bow before you and give you that honor and glory and praise and worship that is yours right and due alone. But we come, Father, and we open our hearts to you to worship you. You are good, and your love endures forever. We come on this first day of the week to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we do each week, having done that at Easter Day last week. Thank you for his victory, having achieved that eternal salvation that only he could bring about by his death on the cross. You raised him vindicated him and glorified him. He is Lord of all. He's now exalted at your right hand. We worship you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to you be all glory and praise forever. We thank you that you made us and you saved us. We are twice yours, your people, your flock, led by our great shepherd, we are secure in your love forever. You give us everything we need and lead us on as we trust in you. You are with us always, Lord Jesus, you said. So as we come, we open our lives to you to hear what you have to say to us today. As we come, we confess to you our sins, whatever they may be. We bring them to you in the quietness now. Thank you, Father, that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just. And will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. May that be our assurance now. Come and bless us, please, Father. We bow before you, our hearts and our lives, all we are, and cry out to you to come, please, Father, by your Holy Spirit, to do among us what you want to do today. Achieve your purposes by your word. It come with power. And, um, may we respond in faith, love, and obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray, we continue now in the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to sing again now a hymn about call to mission far and near. Hear the call.
Catherine's now going to come and bring us our Bible readings. Thank you, Catherine. The first reading this morning is from Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 to 6, and is on page 748 in the Pew Bible. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look about you. All assemble and come to you, your sons from afar, and your daughters are carried on the hip. Then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. The wealth and the seas will be brought to you. To you, the riches of the nations will come. Herds of camels will cover your land, young camels of Midian and Epha, and all from Sheba will come, bearing gold and incense and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. The second readings from Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 20, and is on page 1000 in the Pew Bible. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority and heaven in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Amen. So let's sing again about that worldwide mission of the Lord, from the sun's rising to the sun's setting.
Let us pray. Lord, please speak through your word now to our hearts. That which you wish us to receive today, which you've sent to achieve your purpose in our lives and the life of your church and its mission here in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're now on the other side of the depths of Holy Week and the joy of Easter Sunday. The saving work of Jesus on the cross is completed, it is finished, he cried. And we've seen his glorious victory and vindication in his resurrection from the dead. And we're now with the disciples meeting the risen Christ on that mountain that he told them to go to through the women, through the, the angel's message to the women and his own message to the women at the tomb that first Easter day. So the 11 are there. It's 11, of course, because there is no Judas now. And it's possible that as well as the 11, there are others like we got at the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus and his disciples there, but others round about as well. Can't be sure. And here in this mountain, Jesus unfolds the next stage of his mission, his own earthly mission completed his sending his church out into this next phase with what's called the Great Commission, his mission to the world through the church, of which we are part and we're still in. We know what the reaction of the disciples when they see Jesus. Did you hear that? As Catherine read it. When they saw him, they worshipped him. They worshipped him. We know that Jesus is not just a, a good person who shows us something of God and teaches well and does great things. He is God. Worthy of worship, we can never make too much of him. Praise to God the Father and to the Lamb, as we said in our call to worship, Jesus. Our Lord and our God, as Thomas said, they worship him. His resurrection has confirmed this. And worship is our right response to him too. But, we're told, some doubted. It's a strange wee inclusion there, isn't it? If you were writing something polemically to persuade people of something, you would tend not to put the negatives in uh, because that would go against your argument. You may, but some doubted. Why did Matthew put that in? Because it was true. It evidences the reality of the narrative, the fact that that statement is there. Maybe they just weren't sure it was really Jesus. Maybe it was just momentary. Perhaps they couldn't see him clearly. But some doubted. We all have doubts at times. Let's take encouragement today from the fact that even here, at this astonishingly uh, amazing time, people had doubts. Uh, sometimes I've heard of a speaker who had just proclaimed the gospel and uh, uh, folk had come to Christ in large numbers and as he drove home, doubts crowded in about the very existence of God. Now you might think, that's terrible, but we know exactly what that means and it's the devil's work, of course. Put in that very foundational doubt at that point and it will destroy the ongoing work that he didn't like happening anyway. But some doubted. But take encouragement from the fact that they didn't get led astray or derailed by these doubts. They came through them. Um, and they went on worshipping, loving, obeying, living for, and indeed dying in many cases for their risen Lord Jesus Christ. Someone has helpfully said, never let what you don't know shake your confidence in what you do know. Don't let those things that creep in get out of perspective. Hold on to what you do know, and God will sort out these other things. So let's look at the Great Commission of Jesus. First, the authority of Jesus. Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. 
We might think that's kind of self-evident. Just said Jesus is God. He has this authority in himself. God has given it to him. But there's something more going on here. Um, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. He already has authority over that because he's God. But there's a sense, I think, in which that authority is now worked out from inside as a result of him coming and living and die and rising again. He now, through his death for our sins to bring us back to God, has an authority that allows him to call people to himself, all those who will come God has given to me will come to me, all those who are going to come to faith. He's got that authority to, for them to come, and the church will grow throughout the whole world. So we've seen that authority already in his ministry over nature, disease, demons, death. His teaching, which was markedly differently, different from the religious leaders, his authority to judge. It's important to remember that. It's been given to him, the authority to judge everyone. Yes, Jesus. His authority in the lives of his disciples, his authority, his lovely thing. He said at one point that uh, no one takes my life from me, but I decide when I lay it down and when I take it back up again. That's authority, isn't it? Even on the cross, he still reigns there as he gives up his life. And now we have this astonishing and comprehensive statement of Jesus' authority, which gladdens our hearts. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. He has died and risen again. By virtue of his death and resurrection, he's brought about redemption for all who will believe in him. But he has this claim over the whole world. I was just thinking, as spoke in St. Mary's, that's an audacious claim, isn't it, in our day? It goes against our secular mindset, which so infects us, our pluralistic um, kind of syncretistic, bringing things together, you know, that's okay for them. No, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Hear the full impact of that for what it means for every single human being, indeed for the whole of creation, that Jesus is Lord. He is the one to whom authority and power is given. Our mission partner, Sam and Ruth Lee, served for many years in Laos in Southeast Asia. Sam said that when he first arrived in that country and stepped off the plane onto the tarmac, onto the the ground of that country, the words of Psalm 24 came to him, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And he welled up at the thought that this faraway land sent there by God for this purpose, um, Buddhist, communist, nonetheless, all authority in heaven and earth is given to Jesus, and that's so everywhere. Here in Hoyk, too. Sam and Ruth now have a new role in, a um, very widespread role in seeing people in Europe and Africa from countries that don't have their own OMF base and office, seeing them sent out on mission. Um, he was speaking about Christ as the answer ministries is in Kenya. They want to send missionaries to every country in the world. Well, that's a big undertaking for Sam and his team. So um, pray for them because they're both off work, Sam and Ruth, at the moment. Sam had a heart attack, no tissue damage, but two stents put in. He's off for a month. Ruth had a recurrence of epilepsy that she's not had for 20 years. She's off work for a month, and other folk are taking on this work. Pray for them. Frontline work, you see, they're based in the Netherlands now, but they're sending workers out. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. All authority is given to me, says Jesus. So we come to the command of Jesus. All authority has been given to me, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Do you notice here that this instruction command is not issued on the basis of the great need of people, which is great. 
It's not issued on the basis of our desire to do it, sort of inspiring us to do it from inside so that that wells up and we want to do it, although that's important too. Do you see the basis of it? It's simply a command on the basis of the authority of the Lord. Go! It's not feelings-based or needs-based. Go to all nations to make them disciples. Here's a map of the world. I thought it'd be useful to have a map of the world. You'll not see all the countries there in it, but uh, it's good to see it spread in that projection in front of us. Makes some of the countries look bigger, we know that, but uh, there it is. No part of this world is excluded from this command of Jesus. Go and make disciples of all nations. This worldwide mission was God's intention from the start. It was never just to be focused on His people in Israel. They were to become a light to the Gentiles, take it to the world. They failed in that, but then there was one to come, the Messiah, who was going to do that. Now, reading from Isaiah 60 is one example of the nations, well, the nations coming to God from all over, gladdening the hearts of God's people. Let all His people rejoice as the people come to Him. Scotland, Syria, South Korea, North Korea, Japan, Sudan, Israel, Ukraine, India, Russia, Mongolia, Sheila's great, great uncle, great, 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 not sure, uh, was a missionary, first missionary to Mongolia in the 19th century. You name it, it is included, whatever country, pick out one, it's included to Jews, Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, Sikhs, atheists, humanists, communists. And here's some names of people groups I'd never heard of, but the WEC prayer guide asks us to pray for them, and there's people working among them. Kara Kalpaks in Uzbekistan, Almak in Turkmenistan, Uyghurs in Kazakhstan, all these people groups, hundreds of thousands of them. Go and make disciples of all nations. So Jesus' disciples arising from their relationship with Jesus, their worship of Him as Lord, His authority, His command are to go into all the world with the gospel. And we see that happening in the early church. There was lots of barriers to be overcome. Uh, first it was just the Jewish church, so they had to, they thought the Gentiles didn't really have a part of this. It took time for, them, for that to break out and for the gospel to go to the non-Jewish people and into Samaria. And Paul then, his great missionary journeys into what is now Turkey uh, and um, into Europe, and Greece, and Italy. We understand Spain. The gospel ripples spread outward. Jesus says in Acts, we have in this 40-day period after His resurrection, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And in course of time, the gospel came here to Scotland. We tend to forget this, don't we? That we are the recipient. We should say, thank you, Jesus, for this command, because out of that command came the gospel to us through Ninian among the southern picts in the 5th or 6th century and Columba among the northern picts in the 6th century. Many centuries later, a young man called Hudson Taylor. Can we send the map of the world back up again, possibly for a minute? Hudson Taylor sat with a map of China. China's there, yes, quite a large country, huge population, of course. A vast land with a vast need of the gospel. And in young Hudson grew a vision of reaching this land with the gospel. And hand in that, hand with that came a vision of the greatness of God to meet that need in terms of strategy, personnel, and money. All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth, therefore go. And he believed that wholeheartedly. We might say, oh, we can't afford that. Uh, well, if it's Jesus' command, as Hudson Taylor, I think, said, 
with the call comes the supply and the enabling and the equipping and the work grew as many from various countries in response to God's call gave themselves to meet the growing work and gave their money. So will you, will I go and make disciples? It's a question of obedience. It's been my prayer since I entered the ministry that through my ministry there'll be people who'd be called into the ministry and also called to go to the mission field, to be sent into that direct, full-time purpose, intention of making Jesus known where he has not been made known, whatever that may be that people are sent. So might that be you or somebody that's watching online today, that you are called to go to that place that God has put in your heart to tell them the good news of Jesus Christ. Of course, we don't have to go far away to fulfill this command of Jesus. We can't have that opt-out, oh, I can't go. Well, yes, we can, because this is a mindset as well as a physical move. Go. This outward-looking direction that we're called to, rather than being inward-looking and navel-gazing, go. So we don't have to go very far at all. It includes those in our families, among our neighbors and friends, those around us who do not yet trust in Christ. It embraces Hoyk and district. We are to carry out the Great Commission here just as we go about our everyday lives, as we're getting on with everything we get on with, to speak a word for Jesus with that intentionality. This is a timely sermon, isn't it? For drawing nearer is the mission, the Revive Scotland mission in May, through which we can directly respond to this call of Jesus to go. Perhaps we can be in the team itself, being trained and then going out to chat quite naturally. A friendship basis really to those we meet in the streets, those we've never seen before, those we have met before. Joining in with a team that's going to come from America and from other parts of Britain and locally here to do that. Or maybe we can be involved in one of the many roles which you will find on the list in the magazine this month. Um, and we've got it on the screen. hospitality to the team, making meals, worship being in the band, team members, as I was saying, to be involved in the worship and training and going out and inviting people, making connections, stewarding, um, stewarding at the events, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday afternoon, Thursday and Friday and Saturday evenings, car parking, where the toilets are, interacting with people, response team, when people come forward at the end of a meeting, they need to be spoken to and prayed with, perhaps led to Christ, told what the next steps are, counseled. Uh, first aid, if anyone's a first aid certificate, they can support the events. Prayer meeting Monday to Wednesday at 7 o'clock at the HQ, which is Trinity Church. Face painters, anybody good at face painting? As you can gather, I'm not, but... Uh, some of you might be advertising, going round putting the flyers in shops. Well, Joyce can do that in her shop, but all the other shops and places in the town, they'll come two weeks in advance and they need to be placed. Security, they want people to go and camp out out in Brunton Park and burn food for a couple of that's, that's how, how about that for a wee a short holiday? S staycation up in Burn Foot, camp there. Um, to secure the stage and all the rest of the things that will be left out. Local testimony, people to see how Jesus has changed their life at the meetings on Friday and Saturday, and they want local people to do that, so it's embedded in the culture here. Accommodation, usually for single females, about three or five, three to five of them, if you can give a bed for the night. And sign makers help by making rudimentary A4 sized wooden signs, so if you're good at carpentry to advertise the event. So you see there's lots of different ways we can be involved. Pray what that is for you and see this as a great opportunity to obey the Great Commission.
encourage people in our families and among our friends, people we come in contact with as we play sport or engaged in whatever it is we do. Invite them to come along. Take them along to the meetings and we can all pray for Jesus' power to be at work. Go. Jesus says, go and make disciples. We need to note this. He doesn't say, although this is what we want to see happening, go and bring people to trust in Jesus and come into the church. No, he doesn't say that. He says, it's much more holistic and deep, isn't it? Um, and thoroughgoing, go and make disciples. Uh, one who is a pupil, a student, a learner of and from Jesus, who's under the discipline of Jesus, for whom Jesus is Lord, for whom that's growing and developing all the time throughout our life, whatever age and stage we are, because somebody said the school days for a Christian are never over. This is lifelong learning. We don't graduate with a mortar board like they do from nursery into primary school now. It's lifelong. I was thinking of the amount of time, attention and effort someone might make in other areas of life, in your work, profession, whatever it might be, uh, in developing their golf swing. And I've got a joke that came through the, this morning from Golf Monthly, but it's Ronnie Corbett. Um, my wife has a ridiculous idea that I spend too much time playing golf, to give it too much attention, it came to a head at 11.30 last night uh, when she said, golf, 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 that's all you think about, that's all you do, and that's what exercises your mind and fills your life. I got a bit of a fright, I can tell you, he says, because you don't expect someone to come up to you in the 14th green at 11.30 at night. The amount of time people spend on their hobbies, on their sports, practicing their instruments, music, rugby practice, whatever it might be, time with family and friends, spouse, loved ones, all good stuff. But how much more should we be growing in our relationship with Jesus? Does that get sidelined? Well, it's not to go and make disciples. We need follow-up. Um, Revive Scotland News, Hope Explored, and it's really excellent that Robin Turton of the Baptist Church works with Christianity Explored, knows Hope Explored really well, has run courses, and is able, therefore, to help us coordinate the follow-up, this short three or four-week course, for those who respond to be fed into so they can be grounded in this faith or explore it further. Um, be grounded and discipled and then find a place in a local church where that discipleship can continue. We need to get that in place before we start the mission. We can't wait till afterwards and put that in place. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, baptizing them. Jesus says the new disciples are to be baptized into the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Isn't it wonderful that in all these early manuscripts, without exception, the Trinity appears? People say to me, the Trinity doesn't appear in the Bible. Well, yes, it does. It is there by implication so in so many places. Here, Jesus says that baptism is to be in the name of the, all persons of the Trinity, the God in three persons, because every person of the Trinity is involved in someone coming to faith and in their new life. Baptism into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is Christian baptism. Someone comes to faith, and the inward reality is that the Holy Spirit has brought them to new birth, new life, and uh, the Holy Spirit immerses them and enters into their life. So the outward sign of that is we are immersed in the water as a sign of that reality, dead to sin and alive to God beginning a new life in baptism. Sprinkling, we do. Some churches don't do any sprinkling. Say it's got to be full immersion. We do sprinkling and full immersion. If someone wants to have a, a big uh, 
birthing pool or paddling pool up the front here. That's great by me and hopefully by you. We need to, there's practicalities about it, but there's nothing like the symbol of adult baptism when someone gives their testimony and goes down into the water and comes back up again. Burnt our bridges for the past and moving on into the future with the Lord. In some parts of the world, to be baptized is a serious, costly step. No way back can result in you being disowned by family and by society. Jesus says, if to be baptized, then they're to be taught. They'll be taught to obey everything Jesus has commanded. You see how rigorous this is and how deep a strategy To be taught, he doesn't just say teach the truth, he says teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. That kind of presupposes that we already are learning that and obeying it, of course, doesn't it? So it's challenging to us, and then we teach it. And I think we can soft pedal this. It's too difficult for them, it will put them off. We want them to be involved in the life of the church, let's not make it hard for them, but no, we, this, is a, this teaching is essential. so that we can walk in the ways of the Lord in a growing way all our lives. And we discover that through the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, in prayer by the Spirit. We discover it in our fellowship together in the small groups that are essential for discipleship, one-to-one interaction in Bible study, one-to-one conversations, mentoring, an environment created where it's safe and easy for people exploring or people who are new to faith to come in and to learn and grow and we build trust and love. How we need that. You know that in our today's society, uh, just in particular in terms of family and sanctity of life and sexuality where The world has diverged from Jesus' teaching. To hold to Jesus' teaching is challenging and puts us in a collision course. We're seeing that, aren't we? Collision course with our society. Thank God for Christian Institute and Christian Concern and Care and others who help us engage with these matters. We can't just say, we'll just go along with society because that's easier. We must hold to Jesus' teaching, molded and shaped in everything by the teaching of Jesus, by the Word of God. So go, make disciples, baptize, teach dynamic stuff. And as it happens, it's it's recyclable, isn't it? It's recycling because those who are taught are taught also to go and make disciples so you get people coming in and they grow to faith and then they so the church sustains, is sustained by this teaching of Jesus. You know, I often ask, I'm going to ask now, how would you feel if 40 or 50 new Christians started coming along here to TV on Sunday morning, more than the number of us who are gathered here this morning? That would inevitably make a difference to the whole feel of the thing, wouldn't it? We'd have to be different. We'd have to do things differently. How are, we, how are you up for that? Yeah, good. It's exciting and scary at the same time, as so much of our Christian living is. And we need to welcome and love and nurture these new folk who come along deeply. So there's Jesus' commission, but we can't stop there. In response to the command of Jesus, we go. But it isn't just rolling up our sleeves and getting on with it because this is what we're called to do. Jesus' lovely promise with which he finishes, the presence of Jesus, our last heading. It's just lovely, isn't it? What a lovely way for the Great Commission to end and for Matthew's Gospel to end. Surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Uh, What are you going through this morning? What's happening in your life? Hear this 
promise of Jesus. I am with you. I am with you always. So when things are really awful, responsibilities are tremendously heavy, when your heart is in your boots, when you're feeling awful, when you're not well, when others die, when things are going on, you're perplexed, don't understand it. Remember this. I am with you always, says Jesus. Always, every day to the end of the days of this age. And specifically, when we step out in obedience to his command here to go and make disciples, fearful, but trusting in him and obeying him, then we have this, the assurance of his authority and his command, when we have this personal, experiential reality of his presence with us. Isn't that wonderful? Emmanuel, God with us when he was born. Here he is before he returns to his father saying the same thing, I am with you always. And just as we close, let's go back to how we started the service with that lovely vision from Revelation of the end of it all with the gathering. After this I looked as John and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. Could we have the world map back up just as a visual aid? The great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Thank you. A great multitude that no one could count. We are so used to church services with empty pews. No one can count this multitude. And who is in the crowd? Those from every nation, tribe, people, and language. The Great Commission is complete. Lord, hasten that day and make us faithful to obey your Great Commission today and as long as we have breath. Amen. We're going to sing now, I, the Lord of sea and sky, and then we'll have our prayers for others after that.
Let us pray. Lord God, our Father, we praise you for the good news of Jesus Christ, your Son, for the salvation he has brought about for us through his cross and resurrection. He is the Lamb who was slain. As we have heard this morning, his command to go and make disciples of all nations, may we obey him to whom all authority in heaven and earth has been given, knowing his presence with us in it always. What a strategic call this is, Lord. Enable us to fulfill our place in this and for your church to be alive and empowered for this direct mission of making disciples of Jesus Christ, your Son. We pray especially for the mission here in Hoyk in May. May there be a deep and widespread response from the Christians in our town and district to be vitally involved in the mission in whatever way you desire as an outworking of the Great Commission right here in Hoyk. May the authority and power of Jesus be at work within the team and all who take part, those from the USA and other parts of Britain, those from here, so that we know we are serving not in our own strength, but His. May there be your protection over and around it all. May there be remarkable unity in Jesus across the team. May the authority and power of Jesus be at work in the town and district in terms of how the mission is received uh, when the publicity begins in earnest so that there will be a conviction of sin, of their great need among people, drawing, and you will draw them by your authority and power to saving faith in Jesus. May they be baptized and be discipled well and find their place in a church fellowship where they grow in their faith. And may there be great joy in this town and district. Father, we ask your blessing on all who have gone far from home to bring the gospel to the nations. We pray for Sam and Ruth Lee and the family in their new role, seeking to see people in Europe and Africa sent out to Asia in mission. Please heal them both and restore them to full health to be able to carry out their work. May they find the partnerships and systems and have the resources and people to be able to develop this work in a sustainable and substantial way Pray too for their daughter Lisa on board the OM ship Logos Hope, bringing the gospel to different places the ship goes to. Be with her as you have promised, and may she be very aware of that even right now. Sovereign Lord, we continue to pray for all who are caught up in the war between Israel and Hamas. May there please be an end to it in accordance with your purposes. May those bereaved be comforted. May the hostages be released. May those who are in so much need have the practical help they need. May there in your mercy be a just peace. Father, we pray for those among us who need our prayers, those who mourn the death of a loved one. May they look to you and find the comfort you promised to those who mourn. We think, too, of others who need our prayers for whatever reason. We ask you to be at work in your grace in those who are unwell or injured in body or in mind, who are going through tests, treatment, surgery, or awaiting those things. We name them before you now in the quietness. Pray particularly for Kate's daughter in hospital, recovering from injuries after a car, after an accident. Pray for your healing hand upon her. For Peter's wife, Diane, with her foot injury, and MS, please be with her in your healing power and others known to us. So many needs among us, Lord. We bring them to you lovingly to your compassion, for you to act in your compassion. 
Hear us, Lord. And we bring our thanksgivings to you for hearing us and for being with us, for answered prayer, that we can trust in you entirely and find you utterly faithful always. Thank you. So we bring all our prayers, spoken and unspoken, in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's conclude our service by singing, Facing a Task Unfinished, as it is just now. Jesus Christ the 
Go now in the love of Christ to love him and serve him. Let's say the grace together. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.